Hey, everybody, welcome to the official Do Good Better podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Kirby, and of course, we bring on guests and experts to help our small and medium-sized nonprofit brethren raise more money, do more good. I've got a double feature for you today. Not uh, two people, two topics, one guest. We're going to compress a bunch of information into your brains in half the time that you probably should, because that's kind of how this podcast works. Um, But I would like to welcome uh, today... Uh, a guest who's not going to only talk about uh, retirement planning, some skills that you're going to want to have as a fundraiser, but also is a founder of a nonprofit himself. So we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, successful fundraising is going to use all the discernible skills that you want to know and how to. Derek Fiorenza, he is the uh, co-founder of SG Retirement Planners and the founder of F4 Service. Derek, how are you? Welcome to the official Do Good Better podcast. Thank you, and congrats on all of your success. It's amazing what you've built. I know last time we talked, I saw you have a book out on Amazon. So if you haven't gotten the book, make sure you get the book. I did. Uh, your check is in the mail for the plug. I appreciate you already. Uh, this is uh, going to be so fun because I think this combination of topics is so incredibly valuable because somebody as a founder of a nonprofit, but also has a retirement planning background is going to be an absolute uh, goldmine of information for individuals who are probably at nonprofits that don't know a lot about A, retirement planning, or B, what to even say in a situation that this comes up. And that confuses and terrifies people. And we're going to go and tell people that it's just going to be okay. But first, before we get into this, a 5,000 foot view on who you are, what you do for those who are scrolling through iTunes and are super interested, but have no idea what on earth is going on. Derek, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. I'm humbled to be part of this uh, podcast today and on your show. Um, my number one goal in life is to add value to others, others' lives and to serve with my heart. I feel uh, my, my personal faith in the Lord has certainly governed all of my actions and my steps, whether it be philanthropic or professional. And I look to make each engagement, each interaction um, special, customized, and I try to treat everybody with respect and compassion. The number one trait that I admire in a leader is humility. And uh, we have a motto in our company and both our company and nonprofit, but also personally, um, we're striving to always lead and serve with humility. So we call it humble confidence. You don't wanna be arrogant, you don't want to turn people off. You want to be understanding. You want to be compassionate. Um, that's where the humility comes in. But you also want to be confident in what you do. And I believe very strongly in the work that I do professionally with our firm, Summit Group Retirement Planners. We believe every American deserves an opportunity to retire debt-free and with dignity. That's our focus. So when we work with companies on designing their 401k plans, we conduct employee education and meetings, and, and part of those meetings are understanding what is somebody going through from a financial standpoint. Do they have student debt? Do they have credit card debt? Do they have auto loans? Do they have a mortgage? Are they using a budget? Uh, what kind of habits can we work on building and instilling? Because it's like anything in life. It's about consistently practicing good habits. So I enjoy that. It gives me the opportunity to work with um employees and understand what their needs are. And then I parlay that service from a financial standpoint into the nonprofit world. And I focus on our organization, I should say, focuses on repurposing and redirecting food from sources to recipients that are in need. And that is in the form of food drives and also in the form of food rescue. And we serve as a facilitator. I'm sure we'll get into that, our model, but we serve as a facilitator. So we are, think of us as an unpaid broker. We're connecting the dots between those that have the resources to those that do not have the resources, empowering communities on a localized level. And the beauty of our model, since we are funded privately, we don't charge any operational fees to either our donors or to our recipients. And we always strive not to take governmental funds. So, um, you know, in the past we have through the PPP loan last year during COVID, but we don't apply for governmental grants. We're privately funded. And it's important to our values to keep the food that we are distributing local and to make sure that we are staying from a, a political standpoint, bipartisan. We're here to serve all people. We're not taking a, a sour Republican or Democrat. We are purely here to help serve and provide food to those that need it. 
One of the things I loved what you said was the idea of humble confidence. And I think as a fundraiser, the ultimate guide to being a great one is that balance between humility and confidence. It is very difficult for a fundraiser to be confident when talking with people about retirement and uh, where they can use their money and how they invest it and how they can take uh, you know, investments and, and use it towards the nonprofit world. Because it's very confusing because none of us have taken a Series 7. All we want to do is help others and raise money and make impact and profit. How do we, as the nonprofit leaders in our community, exude confidence when it comes to financial planning, period? I'm going to start there because it is a very confusing world. I think we need, I think we think we need to know too much, which is not too much. Uh, but how do we start? Maybe that's the, how do we get in the right mindset to talk about money in that sense so that we give the sense of confidence that they can trust us as an organization with their investment and we are going to do good with that to make the best amount of impact? So I'm going to provide, I guess, two answers. One is going to be more tactical and like, here's the takeaway tips as you're taking your notes. Uh, and the other one is going to be more conceptual. Um, so I, I say this is the same thing I would say to anything in life is being your authentic, true self. Uh, when you're fundraising for a nonprofit organization, you have to be you and you have to, whatever mission you're volunteering with, you have to make sure your values align with that mission. So that when you're making a request to support that organization, it's a natural request. It comes from your heart. It's important nonprofits be bold and ask me for money. And the reason I say that is if they don't have the money, the resources, they can't run. So you really need to look at a nonprofit organization as a business. And if you believe in the nonprofit, you believe in the business, it needs to sustain itself. And how does it sustain itself? Either from program fees or dollars that are being raised. And we can get into how you raise dollars. I can maybe provide a different perspective because our nonprofit, I founded it 10 years ago, uh, in 2011, we are still small, you know, relative to a lot of the larger nonprofits in the country. So the way we go about raising funds are going to be different. We don't have uh, a built-in pipeline each year of recurring donors. We don't have big foundations and organizations that have been established to support our mission. We're still trying to get our message out there. So from that standpoint, it's very grassroots. So here are some tangible things that we do that I would, um, I guess, impart upon you and, and your listeners, because I think there is value in it. Uh, one of the first things I did as the founder of the organization, I put together a board of directors and I took myself off of all of the financials. So I don't have the ability to write checks. I don't have access to the bank accounts, the checking accounts, the savings accounts. I do get the updates from the finance committee and at our monthly board meetings. So I kind of know where we're at. But I have no check writing ability. I can't go into a bank and take out money. Um, so from that standpoint, it's very, very clean and transparent. So the board and our donors and our constituents understand there's a clear line of sight. He's the founder, but he has no connection to it. The second thing I did, I don't take a salary from the organization. So I've been reimbursed in the past for mileage driving food from point A to point B. Even that, as we've gotten bigger, I've phased out. So I've been able to demonstrate to all of our donors each and every year, a clear line of sight from founder and then interest. Another thing I've done, and now we're gonna get a little bit into the weeds, but this goes into legacy planning. It's important and every nonprofit can do this. If you have a board of directors, you can have a conversation with them about things as simple as your life insurance. And do you leave a nonprofit in the will for your life insurance, the proceeds of the death benefit, give you the portion of it to the organization. One of the things I did, I took out an insurance policy on my life. So if I pass away, and only if I pass away, the, in, the um, organization receives that death benefit. And I did that specifically to set number one, proof of concept, but two, to set an example. So now I can go to other board members and say, have you considered uh, making a donation, not only your annual contribution or your monthly contribution, but donating a portion of your life insurance to the organization so that when you die, the proceeds from the death benefit of your insurance policy go to support the organization tax-free. 
Um, depending upon, you know, how advanced your organization is, there's other strategies that tie in with insurance. I find insurance to be the easiest one because it's a concept we're all going to die. So we can all plan for that. And if we all have insurance, it's, you can divert a portion of that to the charity that you're supporting. Another key concept or an easy concept to understand um, without giving any type of tax advice or financial advice, just explaining rules. When someone turns age 72, the IRS requires that they take a minimum distribution from their individual retirement accounts, their IRAs. An individual can choose to defer taking that distribution and have it pass through to a nonprofit organization, and that won't affect then their adjusted gross income. So sometimes you talk with your accountant, obviously, sometimes that becomes a tax strategy to support a nonprofit organization and to keep your adjusted gross income lower. Obviously, I'm not giving tax advice or, or financial advice, but these are strategies and tactics. Uh, I also see another, a lot of nonprofits will actually employ um, stock donation programs. So if you have mutual funds, you have stocks, you can donate stocks and mutual funds to support a charity. Something that we've done as an organization is I look at, so, so I look at fundraising from several lenses. You have to raise for the immediate to support your operations and to support your staff, especially if you're not deriving any income from your operations. So number one, how do we create sustainable income? One model that we've put out is recurring donations. So we go to our constituents and our board members and we ask them to see if they can get other individuals to donate monthly to the organization. It could be as little as a dollar, $5, $10 a month. It's the idea of getting recurring donors on the books. That provides one silo of revenue. The second silo can come from grants. There's private, private foundation grants that you can apply to. And then if you think of the other two silos would be uh, sponsorships and events. And I always like to take sponsorships and events and separate them. You see a lot of nonprofits have golf outings and galas. They tie the sponsorship to the event. And if COVID taught us anything last year, we weren't having events, what happens to those sponsors? So we were actually trying to get ahead of that. And what we've done is we've built up a model where we seek and solicit sponsors to sponsor on their own accord without being tied to an event. And then events, we usually do that based upon like a program. So like you would pay a program fee to get in and be part of the event and it's a donation. And, and in lieu of your donation, you can participate in the dinner or you can participate in the run. So those are some strategies. Now, here's the real nice one. And if you can think about fundraising from a long-term, like, and this is 10 years plus for us, but if you can look at it from a 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 year perspective, long, long, long term vision, an endowment is a great way to also provide sustainable funds. And I'm going to use a large number, but let's just take a million dollars. If you could put a million dollars into an investment and it generated 5% of interest per year, each year that's $50,000 of revenue. It's hard to get to that a million dollars, but once you have it on the books, and maybe your endowment's 500,000, maybe it's 200,000. If you're able to generate income from that each year, it provides another sustainable source. So as we recap, your sustainable sources of income or revenue can be the recurring monthly donors, which you can count on each and every year, the interest from the endowments, your pre-existing sponsors, the sponsors that you're able to solicit each and every year, and they could be individuals too, but are part of that. Um, and then you would have your grants and any event income. And then beyond that would be then your legacy. So go into your board and ask them to think about the insurance, thinking about the RMDs, thinking about the stock donation programs. But it's going through tactically and understanding the best thing you could do when you're trying to raise money for a nonprofit is to break this up into silos. Where's my recurring revenue? Where's my annual revenue? And then how am I planning for the future? So when the founder dies, when I die, when our CEO Brenda dies, when our CFO dies, how are we replacing them? And that's where the insurance comes in. You always have to think beyond yourself. And that's one thing I learned, like starting the organization at 19. Um, we started doing this work in 2007. I was in college. At 23, I, I, I uh, incorporated it. And, and I'm now looking back at 10 years. It's like, I didn't really know where this was going to go 10 years ago. But as I look towards the future, my legacy will be ensuring that this organization exists to serve those that are most in need when I'm gone. Because while I'm here, I can keep fighting for those 
individuals that are impoverished, that are hungry, that are in need of hope. I can be there to support them and love them. But when I'm gone, I can't do anything, especially if my organization is not ready to sustain itself. So looking towards the future, the end game is not just like today or fiscal year 2021, 2022, 2023. It's like 2070, 2080, 2090, 2100. Like, are we still here doing the work that needs to be done to serve people, not just here in our country, but all over the world? I think one of the questions that I think a lot of nonprofits have because, and thank you for that, because I think that gives everybody kind of like a baseline of like, okay, we got options. And if you're really good at annual gifts and you're really good at events and you're really good at a couple of those things, what you're probably not an expert as is trying to figure out the four letter words that end up in financial planning all the time. The crafts, the cruts, the dafts, the IRAs, all those kind of things that get a little muddled and confusing. I think a lot of nonprofits don't like giving the answer. Oh, I don't know. And so if they don't know the answer, they're not going to bring any of this up. Right. So, so this is a two-part question. Number one, from your experience, and especially from a financial and retirement planning kind of, uh, you know, sort of situation, is saying the word, I don't know, I'm going to get back to you a bad word. And I, I have my own opinions on this where like, I don't know, let me get back to you. And then number two, can you kind of go over some of those options in real high level ways, a crowd, a crowd, a daft, or whatever that is, that would allow us to just kind of understand the basics of the basics of it so that in casual conversation, we can at least attribute something in our brain to what is uh, what they could do now, what they could do tomorrow, what they could do 10 years from now just to kind of give us a lay of the land so that we're not just in this, I hope I read a good, you know, uh, investment magazine or did an investment article the other day just to keep up with the, with the terms. Because there's not a lot, because uh, again, most people who are talking about this stuff already have a financial planner. They already know what they're talking about, but you might not as a fundraiser. So maybe just kind of giving us the lay of the land of some of the more basic things that majority of people who do investment, who have retirement plans already are referencing so at least we can kind of start that conversation about what legacy giving looks like. Yeah, so the, the answer to your first question, it's never a bad thing to say you don't know something and I'll get back to you. I, I, it goes with being authentic. I always say, just be honest. Transparency mm -hmm. to me, think of it as like a deposit into a bank. And I'm talking about the bank of goodwill and building rapport and building relationships, telling somebody that you, you're not sure the answer that you're going to find out but then hold, you have to be accountable. You have to follow up. Mm -hmm. As long as you're accountable, you've actually built even more goodwill and um, you can sleep at night. <laughs> so the, there's the ethical component uh, as well as the, the legal component. You don't want to tell somebody something and then lie and yep. then you lose that donor forever. So the truth is always right, even when it's hard. And if you lose a donor over it, then they weren't the right donor for you. And I think it's another thing where you get another touch point too. They're yeah. giving you permission to give you a call back and you're going to give another touch point and boom, that's a lot nicer than just disappearing off the face of the earth for the next six months. So that's yeah. super helpful. And I appreciate that because that coming from somebody in the financial world saying that you're okay with saying, I don't know. And I'm going to call somebody who's an expert to get back to you. That's something you should put on your radar. So I love it. All right. So let's go over some of these. Um, let's go with some of these four little words. I'll throw one out and then you can give me kind of the who, what, where, when, why on this thing. A crat. You're going to have a lot of things like crat is usually something charitable remainder annuity. Yeah. I, I think for purposes of our, I guess, dialogue, the charitable remainder trust gets really sticky. And I would say if you're going to go down that road, there's low hanging fruit with the IRA, RMDs, the stock donations and the life insurance. If someone felt so compelled to do the crats and the cruts, what they should be doing is talking to a financial planner, an accountant and an attorney. Yes. Now, I love this because that is so, um, I think a lot of people think that they need to know all this stuff, right? I need, as a development director, I need to know all the ins and outs of what a charitable remainder trust is. No, find a partner to help you. And if they don't have one, which they probably do, go find one. And that's a wonderful resource to have at your back pocket. Wouldn't it be great if you were somebody who is, you know, investing as a, hey, I've got a charitable remainder trust I want to give to an organization, or I've got something that was passed on to me. I don't know what to do with it. And instead of having somebody go back, who's not an expert trying to muddle their way through, wouldn't it be great? Like, Hey, let me have you connect with my friend, Derek, 
who's an expert in all of these things. He can walk you through this a lot better than I can. And he's a donor to our organization, loves what we do, understands kind of what the purpose of your gift is. And he's going to take care of you. I trust him with mine. I know you can trust him with ours. And he knows that our organization is good to work with. How much confidence do you have as a donor that who's going to be taking care of somebody who got personalized care from someone who's an expert in the field on what they're talking about? 100%. And I think if you're looking at your organization and the board of your committees, I would absolutely build a subcommittee for special gifts, uh, legacy gifting, and I would get an accountant, a financial advisor, and an attorney involved in that. I mean, the, the concept of those charitable minor trusts or those annuities is just so that the organization is getting recurring revenue or mm-hmm. a one-time revenue. And, and it's so, I mean, like biodiversity sediments is something else. It's like selling your life insurance proceeds and donating it to a charity. It gets really complicated. So what I always say, if you don't have the resources where you have an advisor and an attorney and an accountant, that's an opportunity to kind of ask your board to help you find it. The low-hanging fruit, though, is the RMDs. Like I said, everyone needs to take it once they turn age 72. So there should be some type of an outreach to your constituent base. And let's say you have a couple that are donating, they're in their 50s. Well, do they have parents? If so, do they have an IRA? Is there an opportunity for those donors and reach to their parents and have them consider donating to your charity? Um, the life insurance going right to your board and saying, do you have insurance? Would you be willing to take a portion of that death benefit and donate it to the organization? Or would you be willing to take out a policy and donate it to the organization? You make the organization the owner of the policy, obviously talk to your accountant, and then you can donate basically that premium you're paying as a deduction um, for the life insurance. The stocks, we have individuals that donate stock each year to our organization. They're able to get a deduction for that. Again, confer with your accountant. But I feel like those three, if someone was running an advancement for a small nonprofit and they just started with those three things, those three arrows to get them started, and then the stickier things like the charitable remainder trusts, the biological settlements, they could work with a team. And that's what I would say, get a team, an estate planning attorney, a financial planner, look for a CFP and a CPA. Get those three as part of your organization. And if you get those three part of your organization on that development team, they'll help you work through those trickier things. There's all kinds of like donor advice funds, but keep it simple. IRA, RMDs, life insurance, beneficiary, and stocks. If you just focus on those three ways to give thoughtfully, it would help improve many organizations from a nonprofit standpoint. I've always had this uh, weird thing that I would want to see a nonprofit do, which is have a life insurance 10% drive or 5% drive, right? And your whole drive for an entire month is getting people to put 5% of their life insurance at the end to your nonprofit or 10%. And how much could you raise or how many individuals, it wouldn't even matter how much you raise, to be honest with you, right? Yeah. It's how many individuals would put 5% of their life insurance at the end of their at their life towards your nonprofit. If you had a hundred people giving 5%, and let's just say the average life insurance policy is what? Quarter million, half million, whatever they, it could be anything. What's 5% of that? Add it up times a hundred. So you're, you're so right where the scalability, I think in people's brains, I have to get a million dollars. I have to get a million dollars. You don't. Yeah. You that long game that you you talked about earlier, the the consistency, the authenticity, the confidence, that humble attitude to know that if we keep putting in the work, we're going to do it for a long time. We're going to get paid out. The same effort that we put out is going to come back to us tenfold. And I think that's the kind of attitude about money and about investment and about long-term planning I think nonprofits need to worry about. And I understand, listen, as a small, medium-sized nonprofit, you're probably worried about keeping the lights on most of the days. It gets confusing and tough and hard. But if you're not thinking that 10-year long sort of trudge and that hustle for a long period of time, you're missing a lot of, of, of opportunities to build long-term relationships with people who really care about your organization forever. And the rest, if you have complicated issues, find somebody like Derek and he'll answer the questions for you. And now you've made a friend in Derek to help you out. And the other thing too, and I love what you said to get a CPA, get a C, you know, a certified uh, financial planner and get somebody who's in, who's in banking. This is great because they know people right. who, if they ever ask, I'm looking for a place to make an impact. These are the, these are the gentlemen and ladies who run with the folks who could make the impact and a difference at your organization every day. 
deep, not wide. I always say like, that's important. We talk about that constantly. I have a tendency to go wide on things and, and we have to always come back to center. Mm-hmm. If you're running a nonprofit organization and you really believe in what you're doing, you have to think long-term. It's not enough to say, I'm just worried about keeping the lights on. Like I get that. Everybody has that same struggle. Yeah. You're not alone. Yeah. But if you don't plan for the future, it's like those that plan to for fail to plan, plan to fail. And it's so true. You have to plan long-term. Mm-hmm. You want to be around in 10, 15, 20 years. When we're planning long-term, we're having conversations with our long-term donors. We're having uh, conversations with maybe our older donors. Are there certain keywords that we should be listening to that uh, that individuals are talking about when they're maybe suggesting that uh, they want to leave us in the will? Is there some sort of... Um, I think a lot of nonprofits are having having a conversation about, hey, you're going to die. I think we should talk about this, right? Um, it, are there certain uh, words or key phrases that you should be on the lookout for when having conversations with highly uh, high capacity individuals who really love your organization that would trigger your memory to connect you with or circle back upon to talk about life insurance, to talk about stocks, to talk about some of those financial issues, or are we just looking in generalities to say, listen, this person loves us. They've given to us for 20 years. This just makes sense. We should just have a candid conversation. Yeah. I I don't know that there's a right word, but I will say that there are right steps. Mm. One is doing it yourself. Like I said, a couple of things I've done that are like tangible as I've made transparent. Mm. I don't have access to funds. Yeah. Number two, I have taken a life insurance policy out of myself it's not a cash value life insurance policy. It's a term policy that goes 40 years. So if I'm gone at any time over the next 40 years, the organization gets the money. Guess who the owner of the policy is? The organization. So they control it. I just pay the premium. Mm. So I think when you create levels and layers of transparency, it makes donors more comfortable to support your mission. Number two, if you have that team in place, the financial planner, the CPA, the banker, the estate planning attorney, I would say you could offer group education sessions to those constituents or one-on-one, have a coffee meeting, have a Zoom meeting, and talk through the details of it. And have the professionals that will help construct these types of donations go through the details of it. And you, as the advancement director or the visionary of the organization, be there to communicate the impact, being able to tangibly communicate that your donation will support the organization in perpetuity in the form of X. For example, I would say um, for every dollar that gets donated to our organization, we're able to provide access to 10 pounds of food or around 12 and a half meals. So if you're donating a hundred dollars, that's 400, uh, that's a thousand pounds of food. So I'm able to show that and then you can extrapolate it and say over the next 10 years, that translates into half a million pounds of food. Every organization is gonna be different, but be able to show the ROI of Like I always say, it's not about essentially what's in it for them in terms of the financial return, because usually those high level donors aren't looking for making money off it. They're looking for what's my impact going to be? What's my legacy? Why should I contribute to you over this organization? And if you can demonstrate with not just your passion, but with the the tangible data, the data points, your dollar will go this far and it'll go this far for this long it creates a more compelling reason why they would support you with their 10% of their insurance policy versus XYZ nonprofit. I've, after fundraising for 16 years, I think I might have had one or two individuals who solely gave for tax deduction purposes. I mean, they, they exist out there, yeah. but they're like unicorns. They don't show up very often. And, and the reason is because if you have the capacity to give at the level that requires you to want to shelter your taxes, you've already figured that out. You've got a finance guy, you've got a finance gal. They've already figured that out. You're not really looking to do that. And what you said is beautiful is that that's why you should concentrate solely on your impact, your storytelling, your community uh, needs you, the rallying the troops kind of bit. That's really what the purpose of donating is. You're just facilitating someone's need to feel great and your organization fits the bill so that you'll, that's all you're doing. You're just telling the story about how this gift is going to make a difference in other people's lives. That's why people give. They need to feel connected to your organization. They do not care about a couple of points off of a tax uh, shelter that they've already taken care of 
that they're not going to get any additional benefits on. That doesn't exist anymore, especially with the tax uh, the tax breaks that happened a couple of years ago. You're, the amount of people who deduct who is, is so minimal at this point that that's not a reason. And so it's so much more important that you do that. That's so much more important to know your numbers, to know your impact, and then to equate it, like you said, with a story for the long term and saying how your constant you know, support of this organization will make this much impact going forward. And think about how that's going to make you feel. You can live in the moment with your donation rather than wait until you die. That's how you, that's your annual giving plan right there. So well said. What about your organization is different from, and, and I mean from the nonprofits for F4. Yeah. What makes your organization different than a food bank or some sort of emergency food pantry? Because I think there is, um, that's kind of what most organizations know when they talk about food scarcity. Um, and I and I love to know the difference because I find this fascinating and you've got a niche that just is not seen a lot. Um, I'd love you to kind of explain that if you were just sort of like, I'm involved in food distribution. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's one that we get often. I'm really passionate about our mission because it is a little bit unique and different. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to oversimplify things just for the purpose of our podcast. Obviously, it's more intricate than I'm going to make it. But think of food banks in the ecosystem of food distribution and food service, 30,000 feet. They take donations and then they distribute to food pantries and food cupboards. And in our area, we have a big one, Phil Abundance, they're covering Philadelphia. They're part of a, an organization called Feeding America. And in every major city for the most part, there is a Feeding America food bank typically named after the city. And they're responsible usually for several counties that fall within their realm. And they're responsible for getting both perishable and non-perishable food to those pantries and to those cupboards to distribute on a localized community by community basis. That's food banks. And we've typically thought of them as non-perishable items. They've actually expanded to produce and they do a lot of perishable stuff too. Mm -hmm. Then you have what we call shelters and it's really where warm meals are served and they can be um, derived from food rescue, from restaurants, from caterers, from farmers, from food manufacturers and food producers. Um, or it can be meals that are being cooked by a local church, or it can be meals that are being purchased, but essentially somebody's coming in for a warm lunch or a warm breakfast or a warm dinner. So we type we typically break it out as non-perishable, perishable. Think of the shelters as being like the more perishable and the food batch as being more non-perishable. The role that we're playing is really supporting the shelters and food banks in communities around the country. In over 35 states, we provided support and access to food, whether it be non-perishable or perishable food items to shelters and food banks. And we've been able to do that by working with the donors on the back end and helping them to logistically, consistently, and safely donate food, whether it's a one-off or on an ongoing basis to a local food bank, food pantry, food cover, or shelter within their service area. Mm. And um, the neat thing about it is since we're coordinating that relationship, I'm saying, hello, Mr. or Mrs. Restaurant, I would like you to donate to this shelter, which is right down the street from you. At the end of the evening, can you donate your food? They say, yes, but we coordinate the pickup schedule, when it'll happen and when it'll get donated. That work, that bridge that we're creating then becomes a sustainable relationship. Mm. We check in on them every so often and then we're on to the next one. And we facilitate that. And that relationship might generate thousands of pounds of food if you extrapolate it over the amount of years that it's in existence. We don't charge for that. And that's why our model is so unique. So we're not actually transporting or distributing the food. There are other organizations that will actually work to partner food recovery. I think we're one of the ones that are are unique in the sense that we're doing both um, food drives and food recovery. So we're doing both perishable and non-perishable working with shelters and with food banks. And um, we've also been able to scale this since it's a virtual model with volunteers and with the small staff, we're not depending upon a fleet of trucks that are picking up food and transporting food. We're able to put the onus on the shelter or in some cases we even help find volunteers for that shelter or food bank to get the food from point A to point B. I love that because um, it reduces one of the 10,000 hats that somebody in a nonprofit has to wear which is facilitator of food 
distribution within their needs. And if they can concentrate on building relationships with their donors or putting service into their programs rather than doing this, you've now saved them countless hours and headaches. Um, and that helps them get to the core root of whether they are chronically homeless or, uh, or in shelters for, for, uh, for, for women and families or whatever. You can get to the root cause of some of these things rather than work on logistics of shipping food from point A to point B. So that's why I find it so brilliant. And how did that, yeah. yeah it's very, say it's also very scalable. Yeah. You know, we did over 70% and increased our, our output last year during the pandemic. And unfortunately, so many people were suffering. Um, prior to the pandemic, there were, I guess, 35 to 45 million people that were on some type of food assistance. The numbers in our country were staggering. One in five individuals doesn't know where the next meal is coming from. Um, that's the definition for food insecurity. You don't know where you're getting your next meal. Mm -hmm. And it's so sad. I think around 25% of, of that is, rep is represented by children. So just to think about, like, even when I was growing up, I'm so grateful to the Lord. I always had food and I always had a warm place to sleep. And so many children are, you know, they start out at a young age and they're not in a stable environment. They don't have access to food. They don't maybe have access to a, a clean bed and showers and stuff like that. Things that I don't want to say we take for granted, but things that we have grown up with that we've been blessed and fortunate to have, so many people don't have, even in our country. I'm not even talking around the world. And, and, and we talk about, I mean, we could take this conversation in so many different places, but if we talked about food waste at a very, very high level, roughly 40% of the food that's produced in America is destroyed. It goes into the waste you know, facilities. Roughly $1 trillion US dollars globally is what we waste in food each year. And you think about how many people are suffering and struggling. If we could repurpose 25 to 30% of those items that are being discarded and thrown out, we could feed the whole world. And, and it's just like, to me, why we have these issues, I don't quite know. It's not my job necessarily to, to solve those issues because they're much bigger than one person, but we can absolutely do something about it. And that's what we believe. If we can get food into one person's belly, then we've made a difference. It's not about how many pounds are we serving? It's about each person that we're able to help. As a founder of a nonprofit, uh, you're, you know, there's probably a struggle where if I step down, if I go away, this thing isn't the same. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's founder syndrome. We all, you know, we've seen this happen a while. What do you do to forecast that out and then play that end game where, you know that if you step back, the whole thing still rolls on. And what advice can you give some smaller nonprofits who are maybe working with founders to um, approach and have that conversation about what it looks like when your role in that position is, is done? It's really hard. Um, I speak from personal experience. This is a test. It's not a, I always say it, but it's one thing to say it, it's something to do it. It's not about me, it's about we. And if I believe that, I have to live by that. Mm -hmm. And it's been a challenge for me. So I've been the CEO and founder of the organization since its inception. This year, I turned over the reins of CEO to uh, Brenda Russell. She was our executive director. Now she's our CEO slash executive director. I'm the founder and president. And I've stayed on several committees. I've stayed on marketing. I've stayed on finance. Um, I've been involved in sponsorships. And what I'm trying to do now is develop leaders from within those committees to take over. My goal is next year, I would have transitioned in 2021, the responsibility of CEO. In 2022, I would have transitioned the leadership of marketing, sponsorships, and finance. So then my role would then be more of a support to the CEO and the organization, speaking on behalf of the organization, so understanding what that succession plan looks like, um, who's going to take it over, having the right replacement, and, and then making sure that you still have some semblance of, I don't want to say control, but input, influence is still important. So what we're doing is we're going to um, a monthly hour call with Brenda and our uh, chief operations officer, and we're breaking it up into four segments. Um, it's going to be a review, basically, of our processes, our outcomes, so our performances, any problems that we're having within the organization, and uh, next steps, takeaways. And then quarterly, 
we're going to do a four to six hour meeting amongst the leadership team to just keep our fingers on the pulse of the organization. So our hope is that proactively we can anticipate what pitfalls are going to happen prior to stepping down. We updated a strategic plan that the new CEO had to run by. And I'm really using this year to kind of hold hands. And then slowly, now we're into August, going into September, October, I'll continue to break away, continue to break away. But we groomed this. We actually had a three-year plan to start the succession. And I wasn't ready in January to turn it over 100%. So I've still been more involved than I should be, but I am starting to pull back. And it comes down to setting the proper expectations, having the right people in place. And I always come back to processes. Processes are going to be um, something that every organization should have. Do not let perfection stand in the way of progress. So setting a process and then refining it, continually refining it is perfectly okay. And I think so many times we worry about it has to be the perfect succession and the perfect process. It's more important to have a process and then to refine it than it is to worry about having a perfect process that never gets installed and executed. I, uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the openness of that particular piece of conversation because I know that I've had a lot recently with um, you know, either board members or executives who have founders who are in that particular position as well. And I think that does give us a process. It gives us a framework to kind of think about it. And, um, and thank you for that. I really do appreciate that. I would be remiss if I didn't say, or I didn't uh, ask, there's probably somebody listening to this podcast who's like, I, all right, first of all, A, I need to figure out his F4 because this is, this is awesome and we need to be involved. But number two is I have so many questions about all of these retirement things. I need to get a hold of Derek as well and to use as a reference because that's what we do here on the official Do Good Better podcast is we make friends across the globe and we want you to reach out to them and grab their expertise as well. So how is it that somebody can get a hold of you, ask some questions, get some perspective and, and really figure out how you do uh, on your nonprofit side and then really answer some questions or uh, maybe have some, some sort of... Uh, um, wanted to talk a little bit further on sort of retirement planning perspective on from donors. How do we get a hold of you? Well, I appreciate the question. Um, I'm reading a book right now called Boundaries. I'm not, I'm not sure if you heard of it. And um, I'm in the beginning part of it, but it talks about, like, I'll give you one example. It says helping others is a good thing mm-hmm. in and of itself. But you have to help yourself first. It doesn't mean you have to be selfish. It means you have to have the right order of things. And when you're well taken care of, the analogy I use is a plane. A plane's going down. You have children on the plane. You have to put your mask on first so you can help them. Mm -hmm. If you pass out, you can't help them. Mm -hmm. So the same thing I'll say, too. um, I'm happy to help if if it's in my ability to help anyone. And and that's just kind of how my heart is. I have a problem saying no because I love people and I believe the best in people regardless of how crazy and chaotic the world may be at times, there's still that idealistic, altruistic belief in my heart that people are inherently good and that we can come together to love each other and support one another, even if we have different beliefs. And I, you know, my best friend of 20 years, we're politically on opposite ends of the spectrum. We have conversations, sometimes they're intense, but we love each other and we have compassion for one another and we care about each other. And at the end of the day, we both want to help people. So we might have a different way of wanting to get to that outcome. We, we both care about the end result of helping others. And I, I would say to anybody that's listening, you know, there's an opportunity every day to do two things. Number one, to be grateful. Grateful for your health if you have it. Grateful for your family. Grateful for your job. And then two, to show grace and compassion to other people, which is right in line with humility. It's, it's not thinking that you're the only person that has the answer. And I know the older I get, the more I realize there's less I do know. Mm-hmm. And the more important it is for me to be compassionate because I'm not sure what somebody else is going through, but I can still show them love. So that's a long-winded way of saying I'm happy to help anybody that's listening if I have the ability to. Professionally, our website is sgretirementplanners.com. It stands for Summit Group Retirement Planners. We're in Exton, Pennsylvania. We're on social media. Um, and then for the nonprofit organization, it's called Fiorenza's Food for Friends. And we go by the uh, F4 service, whether it's on the website, f4service.org or on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, F4 service. You can connect with us on there. You can also send us an email. Um, you can send it to team at f4service.org. That's F the number four, 
service.org. And then you can get in touch with us, uh, as I said, via our social media as well. Happy to connect with anybody that has questions about today's podcast or, or needs to talk or wants to partner. Happy to kind of have those conversations. And this is why I was so excited to have a two for one today, uh, is that um, even in our even preliminary conversation that was supposed to be a podcast many weeks ago, uh, that turned into just like, oh, we just started talking for like an hour. And I go so halfway through, I'm like, we should have probably recorded this. This is pretty good. Um, still amazing. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your perspective. We'll put all of those links in the show notes as well so people can get a hold of you. Uh, thanks, Derek, for uh, not only uh, sharing your knowledge, but then for, again, being sort of that beaming light, doing good, and, uh, and sort of being a uh, sort of a, a beacon for others to follow on, on why we do this work in the first place and how we're going to continue doing it in the future. Uh, thank you for being a guest on the official Do Good Better podcast.